So what I think I'd like to do first of all is ask you know our two panelists to kind of summarise what they feel their kind of you know political contribution is, and then let's move on to the whole net zero question. So Bonnie, can I start with you? Give me a sort of you know brief CV and and, and maybe some idea of why you think you you've affected successful change. So as um, Justin said, I've been an academic and a politician, and that's because I've been a green, and so you usually can't get paid for doing that. So I've mostly had to do it in my spare time. So in my academic career, eventually, after a lot of hard work, I got to be a professor of green economics. And uh, I, you know, I made that up. I'm still the only one in the world, but anybody's welcome to join me. And uh, yeah, that's quite a useful thing. Being a professor is, is quite a useful thing. and. Um, I've kind of thought through how we might have happy lives while using a lot less energy and resources. That's really what my research has focused around, which is green economics. Um, and that actually turned out to be really useful when I was elected to the European Parliament in 2014, because I was able to introduce this idea of sustainable finance into the Parliament. It's really mind-blowing how little most politicians understand about the climate crisis and they understand even less about the biodiversity crisis and that ability to sort of see systems and how you know all the decisions we take are actually linked that doesn't really fit into anybody else's politics so I was able to take my sort of academic work and, and that was quite useful I think there but to just to say two bits of legislation that I worked on as an MEP one was what we call mandatory disclosure. I'm sorry, everything to do with politics has a terrible jargon, especially in the EU. But what that means is finance companies and banks now have to tell you what they're doing with your money and what the impacts of those investments are. So prior to this becoming law, they might go off and cut down a um, you know, bit of rainforest where orangutans were living in Indonesia and put a palm oil plantation. You didn't know about that. You just put your money in the bank or pension fund your money was doing that stuff, but they didn't have to tell you. And when we first started talking about this, they were all, well, that's fine. We don't need to tell the punters. You know, it's actually really shocking. Now they have to tell you. And yeah, anything that's sold in the EU, you have to know. That's one thing. And the other thing is slightly more technical, but um, it's called like climate transition benchmarks. It's, it's basically about like most of the money that's invested in financial markets is not invested directly. It's called passive investment. So there's indexes made up which have shares of different companies in them. And what we tried to do was to make people, basically make sure those companies were achieving green investments. So again, it's a way of shifting private finance towards useful ends. Now, we'll come to this in a bit, and I will tell you that this went nothing like far enough to keep me happy. But I think there's two examples of things that have definitely, in the second case, shifted billions of money, in the first case, given you a lot more control over what you do with your money. So, Roger, can you summarise, uh, you know, your political activity, you know, and what kind of what kind of changes you think um, it's 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 brought? Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name's Roger Hallam. I'm going to try and behave myself and not get up. Um, so, and not what? Yeah, sorry about that. There's only so much emotional energy you can expend in a weekend. Um, so, yeah, um, I, in case you don't know, was one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion. Um, I did the, I suppose my claim to fame is I did the strategic design for the um, April 2019 rebellion in London that changed the conversation on the climate in this country. Uh, strategic design is a posh word for set, sort of working out that it works and going around to people going, this will work. <laughs> uh, and people go, no, it won't, and then it does. Uh, I did the strategic design for Insulate Britain. In other words, I came up with the idea that sitting in the motorway 17 times would change the conversation on insulation, uh, and it did. And I did the strategic design for Just Stop Oil, which is an ongoing project, and hopefully we're gonna make history this autumn with thousands of arrests in London. I do loads of other things like grow vegetables for 20 years, but it's not very high status, so I won't tell you about that. We can, we can do, we'll have another session with vegetable growing tips from Roger yeah. Hannah. Um, let's talk a little bit about net zero. So the billing for this was, was net zero. Um, I mean, do either of you want to explain, let's try to summarise net zero. I mean, like really briefly, reduce emissions as much as you can, any that you can't offset. So any that you can't get rid of, you can't squeeze out of the system, you offset using ways of capturing carbon, perhaps carbon capture and storage, which means taking it out of the atmosphere and putting it in the, or, or out of 
you know, uh, sources of carbon dioxide and putting it underground or, you know, growing trees, you know, well, one way of which would be growing trees, burning them, capturing the carbon dioxide and putting it in the air. Uh, in the, so the, the, this concept of net zero, which you, you would have heard a lot about because it's central to all the, all the kind of international debates on how to uh, tackle climate change. Um, who, who wants to start with? I think I'll start with you and then go to Roger on net zero. I mean, where do you stand on, on net zero as a concept? Well, the first thing to say is it's not uh, immediately comprehensible, as you've just demonstrated. Not that you didn't yeah, explain yeah, it very clearly, yeah. but, you know, it took a little while. It was a bit of this and a bit of that. And that, that's why I would much rather say just stop oil. Although, obviously, we've had gas in brackets there, so that's not entirely clear either. But no, so that's my first thing. I think it, it, it can be effective at a policy level, but in terms of people who need to make changes and who need to support changes being made at the political level, it's just not clear. Then I'm, I'm going to pick it all apart because I've got a problem with the net thing because the net thing says, oh, it's still okay to produce carbon dioxide as long as you can find a way to swallow them up later on. And you'll have heard John Kerry, who's the US climate envoy, saying 40% of the reductions we need to make depend on technologies that don't already exist. Cut them out of your sums then. You know, if, if you don't know how to do it, then you can't rely on that. And a lot of what we're saying with net zero is actually exactly that stuff. Oh, don't worry, we'll make carbon capture and storage work. Now, I'm, because this is the third part, which is zero is not good enough. You know, we need to, even if we stop producing CO2 now, we're still on, on road for a really shitty future. So we have to actually start bringing carbon dioxide back. Now, I, I mean, I, I think we need to do that. You know, organic farming will do that. Organic soils are holding a lot more carbon than the sort of thin soils that people are farming on with artificial fertilizers we could be planting more trees all of that stuff's really important but you can't allow it to be a get out from the really significant changes we need to make to the way we live so the whole net zero thing kind of deludes you in two ways it makes you think oh we can still carry on because we'll find some way of absorbing it plus those ways of absorbing it don't really work so yeah that's why i'm quite uncomfortable with it Roger, net zero. Um, yeah, well, the liberal climate movement are, you know, <laughs> I'll say something controversial, stop. The liberal climate movement are suckers, right? Because what the corporate class does is they create, a, they create a frame and then the liberal climate movement, like, buys it and therefore undermines their whole credibility. Like, Climate change was invented to destroy climate action, right? Climate change. Right, first of all, what we're dealing with here is nothing to do with the climate. We're dealing with a death project of the corporate elite. It's a death project by the elites. That's what it should be called, okay? That's what's happening here. They want to kill us because they want to maintain their profits. So, I, 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 I just, just, let me just okay, finish. I'll be two yeah. sex. Right, obviously it's not change, is it? For fuck's sake, right? And so we've sort of got crisis now. It's not a crisis either, it's collapse. Collapse is where nothing comes back, right? That's what it is, is it's a death project by the corporate elite to create the collapse of civilization and billions of deaths. That's what's going on here. Can we, well, um, let's just- I'll uh, just say what, 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 I'll just say something about net zero, right? Okay. I mean, I'm, you know, me and, we're agreed, obviously, net zero is, is like the most fucked idea since forever. <laughs> uh, so, but net zero was created so the Liberal Climate Movement can do workshops on net zero. We shouldn't be talking about net zero, we should be talking about revolution, right? That's the only sort of game in town. So what, can I, can I just ask, like maybe, I mean, you'll probably think this is a naive question, but um, why would the uh, corporate elites want a death project? I mean, why, how is that in their interest? Okay, so the other thing about the liberal elite is they think that the world rotates around interests. That's because they haven't read any Nietzsche, right? <laughs> does, 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 anyone, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Right? Human beings actually quite like death and they quite, quite like adventure and they quite like oppressing people, okay? And what the elites do is they gain power and for a while they're quite functional. And then because of their success, they start to degenerate and then they become completely dysfunctional. And then people start to challenge them and then they kill people to try and stay in power and then they collapse. 
Like this has been going on for 10,000 years. The stage we're at, at the moment is they're being challenged and they're killing people. Except this time, they're killing everyone because it's a global system. Where's the profit in that? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a fair question. What, where's the profit in it? They're yeah. not interested in profit. They're, what they're interested in is power. If they were going to be rational, obviously they would have sorted out the climate crisis like 30 years ago, right? Elites aren't rational. That's why they collapse. That's the proposition. Right, okay. I don't really know where to go with that. Is it well, so, uh, the point about revolution and what's the strategy for change? Let's do that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I think um, I was here when uh, Roger did his, his other session. And um, I am perfectly, you know, I was there when they launched the rebellion in Trafalgar Square. And I was also there for, for closing the bridges. And I absolutely believe that non-violent direct action is an important part of a political system. And I also was there in the European Parliament when movements were on the streets. More powerful in the European context was Fridays for the Future than XR, but they were both really powerful in shifting what I could say in my negotiations and get taken seriously. So I completely acknowledge the value of that work. But what troubles me is that, that I don't think some people in that direct action movement acknowledge the importance of what politicians do. But to me, you absolutely need both of those because the question is, OK, um, you know, you can blockade things, you can draw attention to things, you can shift the narrative, all those things you can do. But at some point, somebody has to pull a lever and make the change. Now, um, Roger has said that he thinks the way to do that is through revolution. My problem with that is if you look back at history, you see what revolutions have done. There's an incredibly messy time at the beginning. I mean, OK, I'm being British, aren't I? A lot of people die. More vulnerable people are more likely to die and not a lot gets done for like five, ten years while all of that's being sorted out and a functional state is being re-established. We haven't got that time to spend, aside from the fact that I don't want those people to die. So I want us to, to... It's extremely difficult to work with this political system for numerous reasons. In this country, we've got an unfair voting system. We've got massive vested interests. We've got people who are profiting, who, are, who we're going to have to take on to, to change things. But ultimately, what I need to know is... From the people sitting on the street, what's the connection to people changing the levers? Because that's what you need to do to actually make the change. Okay, Roger. So, I mean, you, you made this claim that, you know, the actions that you did, you know, changed the narrative on, uh, on climate change and on insulation. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not sure how you can make that claim, first off. But second, you know, how, how, how is sitting, you know, blocking motorways going to actually change politics in Britain? Well, I, I just want to come back there. I'm just talking analytically. I'm not particularly like necessarily into re revolutions or not. I'm just talking as a sociologist. I mean, if you asked me 20 years ago whether there would be a revolution, I would have said you're a complete idiot, right? If you're asking me whether there's going to be a revolution now, I'm saying it's totally inevitable. <laughs> okay, I mean, well, that's, that that, is that's the first thing okay, to well, say. Okay, well, why don't we just start by answering the question that Molly asked you? Yeah, well... I do like to challenge people that... Yeah, like, no, it's fine to challenge, but it's also polite in a setting like this to answer people's questions. So why don't you answer the question, then you can, if you well, want... Let me, let me say, you know, without getting too confrontational, I that think I'm misrepresented by people all the time, uh, in real time, because I'll say something, and then they'll represent it as something that I've not said, because they're not really listening to Nobody, what I'm saying. Molly hasn't <laughs> represented anything you should said. She asked you a question, which you haven't answered. Well, she misrepresents me because she assumed that I'm into revolution. I'm not. I'm just an analyst, right? I'm just here to tell you. Okay. You know, I don't. Forget about the revolution I, bit. Let's just focus on the bit that was the actual question for you. And why don't you answer that? How does sitting down? How does blocking the roads end with you know political change, action on climate change, political action? Well, the first thing to say about sitting on the road is like the majority of people sit on the road because it's the right thing to do. They're not naive enough to think that it's going to like save us. I mean, we're almost certainly going extinct, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, most people in this room have read the stats, right? We're going over 1.5. The likelihood of staying under two is like minute. And once we go over two, we're going over three. And once we go over three, we go over four. So what, is the, what political action, of follow, you're saying basically no political action, but they feel they're doing the right thing. Is that what you're saying? What, what I'm saying is, is I, I'll say this as a sociologist, OK? So we'll just say it as Roger Lower, Hallam, lower the temperature a little bit, right? So the temperature's the, not raised. Uh, 
How many times have you interrupted me? Well, I'm interrupting you because you're not <laughs> answering the question. We ask you a direct question and you say something completely unrelated to it. Well, I was, so get, I was, get, I was getting... So as a moderator just to get you to focus on the question. Well, um, it's a free society, so I don't need to answer your questions. But anyway... No, but when you, when you agree <laughs> to participate in a panel discussion, it is kind of... It, normally, it's civil to a actually take part in a discussion rather than just declaim. Not necessarily, no. It depends what, how the how the person who's framing the questions wants to frame the questions. Well, she's framed a perfectly sensible, straightforward, and you know, intriguing question, which it would be nice to get an answer for. Yeah. Okay. That's your. That's well, your, can, your can view. I, can I rephrase it maybe? Because I, I've read. I, I, the, I think you should, if you give me like 120 yeah. seconds without interrupting me, I'll explain what I'm trying to say. How about that? Well, no. Why don't you answer the question and then I'll give you time to say what you want. But Molly's asked your question. We're having a discussion. You know, can you see that actually answering the question might be more kind of illuminating than you just saying the things that you want to say again? Because you had a session where you said what you wanted to say and now we're supposed to be discussing. We talked about this. <laughs> this, is, this is what direct action in an interview looks like. Right. right. I've done I've done like 200 interviews. Right. I don't do interviews with the press anymore because the press like always frames questions so that so that you you look stupid. Right. Yeah. Give me give me 100. I want 120 seconds from this guy uh, when I'm not being interrupted. That's two minutes. No, no, you can only. No, no, I'm trying to get this question on. If we got okay. another, how long it'll be take if we have more questions now? You know what I mean. The question, the, the question was, how does sitting on the road actually affect political change? And he has an answer. You got 120 seconds starting now. Okay. So the way that direct action is ridiculed is by asking a question like that, right? How does sitting in the road affect? like political change, like it makes it sound really stupid by the get go, right? Obviously, someone who sits in the road is not thinking that they're going to change everything just by sitting in the road. You have to do a contextual analysis, right? In other words, you have to create a direct action campaign it has lots of different elements, you know, it depends where you're sitting, depends how you are with the police, it depends how long it goes on for, it depends on the political context, like, People have been sitting on motorways, for instance, for three or four weeks now in Canada, and they're having private conversations with the chief of staff of the uh, British Columbia. It's possible they're going to stop old growth cutting in Canada for the first time in three decades through sitting on a motorway. The problem here, the problem here is the liberal, the liberal climate class, these two people with all due respect, do not are not empiricists, right? I can give you as much evidence as you like, but they're not going to accept it because they're ideologically opposed to the concept that mass direct action is the only way in the next three years we're going to bring about the revolutionary changes which are necessary to save the human race. I thought you didn't want period. To <laughs> Liberals don't understand. It's that, just can I just say, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be holding the line here, but I appear to be trying to, he's trying to draw me into, uh, you know, a partisan position. But that seems quite a divisive way to present, you know, environmental politics to me, you know, to talk about, you know, rather than saying we've got a, a huge challenge, he's saying I've got a problem with liberal environmentalists. Um, I'm can not, I, I'm can not I, a liberal Can I just interrupt? Uh, no, so no, no, interrupted no, me. Issue, you interrupted right? me about five times, right? I'm going to interrupt you once. I wanted to hand over to Molly to Just, respond to I'm not an you, environmentalist. You had, okay. I've never said I'm an okay. environmentalist. You're a sociologist, but let's... No, let's, uh, no I'm, a, I'm a rebel against political corruption, right? Reframe it, guys. We're dealing with a pathological elite. This is a rebellion against the fucking ruling class, period. It's nothing to do with the environment. Right, the environment okay. is the mechanism of death, right? We need to focus on the people who are creating the death, right? That's the ruling class, as they say. Molly, I mean, do you feel that you've had your question answered? No, no, I don't. So I, I'd like to expand on it a bit. I mean, 
it's, in, it's interesting to, for me to think of myself as the ruling class. I have had some power, and I've got to say, I really enjoyed having power, and I really regret not having power anymore, but I, I feel I used that power to achieve some good things. But I, I need to say, for clarification, I absolutely don't ridicule MVA. I've been arrested myself for lying on the, an air base where there were nuclear weapons, and I, you know, sat in the street, and I've, I've been involved in the work of Extinction Rebellion. What, what turned me Sorry, off... Sorry, and non-violent direct action. Yeah, yeah. What turned me off was the sense that there wasn't really a political strategy here, and I didn't understand where this was going. And a lot of anger and energy was being mobilised without a clear sense of direction. So I'll just say what I understand the political strategy of XR to be. There's quite a lot of discussion about the work of Erica Chenoweth, who's one social sociologist, and what she's done by looking retrospectively at the activity of past civil, um, civil right, the civil rights movement and other movements who have effected political change, is that she's found that a certain percentage of people in the country are convinced and then you get the change. And I believe she's pinned that number down to 3.8%, which is, tells you, you know, obviously you couldn't get a number as accurate as that. So, but anyway, I'm not, I think it's, you know, it's true that if enough people in the country support something, you will get political change and it doesn't have to be a majority. That part I agree with. But the, the, the thing is, somebody has to make that change. And while Martin Luther King was mobilising and engaging people and they were on bus strikes and they were marching and so on, they were also in the White House talking to Lyndon Johnson. So that's really my only point. What the work that's been doing in communicating to this awful government the fact that we are furious that climate change is not being addressed is really important work. But there's a lot of other work that needs to be done, making sure you've got the right politicians there and that you, you mobilise that energy in a way that levers can be pulled. And that's the bit that I think is not really very well thought through. Well, I, Molly, I don't understand. Why do the activists need... Why do they need these political actors like yourself? Why do they... Need, I mean, if they're making that change and they're articulating the change they want to see, why aren't they? I mean, you know, What's that, Roger was saying that in Canada they're talking directly to the government about, you know, yeah, timber. and that would be, that would be a really good thing to happen, and I, I, you know, I would welcome that happening in this country. But just one example. So one of one of the, you know, we could think of lots of policies, but here's a policy in this country. We allow the central bank to issue bank licenses. You can't hold a banking license unless the Bank of England has considered you a fit and proper person. The way the banks are lending at the moment is driving the climate crisis. You should no longer hold a banking license, right? There's a policy. Now, why don't we have that policy? The answer is because um, we, we have the wrong politicians. It's a practical policy. I can explain it to you. I expect, I don't know if Extinction Rebellion support that policy, but you know, they could get into government and talk to people about that. But we've got the wrong politicians who are not responding to that agenda. That's my that's one of my points. But my other point is, at some point, somebody has to be in, unless you think we don't need the Bank of England, we don't need money, you know, which some people argue that. But if you still think we're going to have a system where we have bank accounts and money and so on, then you have to have policies to govern that. And you have to have policies to govern that that are addressing the climate crisis rather than exacerbating it. OK. So, Roger, do you think you need? Is there an ecology, of, you know, in the in the in the environmental space where you're one part of it, and you work, you should be working in concert with, uh, you know, po directly political actors rather than direct activists, direct action uh, individuals involved in direct action. Um. I'm, I'm not going to quite answer that straight away. Oh, well, that's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, you need to, you know, there's this phrase, right? Contextual analysis. You can't answer a question without knowing the context. What, what, what is the context? The context, just to repeat again, is Sir David King says there's three years left in order to prevent climate collapse, right? The collapse of our society and the collapse of civilization for the next 100,000 years. Very few people can cognitively get their head around that. But those of us that can are clear that all reformist like projects are now defunct, right? So I'm saying that analytically, I'm not showing any particular disrespect to the Green Party. I'm just saying when you have three years to basically stop the greatest act of injustice and suffering in human history, the idea of engaging in reformist activity is pathologically immoral. Full stop, right? If you don't get that, you simply haven't emotionally connected with what's going on. You know, you're not connected to what's going on in the global south. 
you know, I know everyone loves to say they're in solidarity with the global south, but let's be honest with ourselves, right? Collectively, we don't give a fuck, right? If, if people connected with what's, what's going on in the global south, they would be in total resistance. And yes, that will end you up in jail, right? There's nothing like dr dramatic about saying that. What, what happening in the global south? What, 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 what are you talking about, Roger? What we're talking about is 1.5 degrees is locked in, right? What happened at COP in November was an act of war against billions of people. That's what happened in November. The world's elites decided that they're not going to do anything about going over 1.5. Everyone knows we're going over 1.5. Hopefully I don't need to tell you about that, right? The real issue now is whether we're going over two. Two degrees is 1,000 million people in the global south on the move. Right? That's like 200 Ukraines. It's like 100 Syrias in a decade within 20 years. Right? I'm just a sort of meek empiricist, okay? I take numbers and I translate them, right? Any social scientist with their head screwed on knows we're heading for global social collapse. Anyone who's in denial of that, about that, is either too powerful to consider it or they've just got their head in the sand. So that's, that's what's called contextual analysis, right? Okay. If you had 100 years to sort out the climate, I'd be in the bloody Green Party, for God's sake. I think they're great. You know, I went to the Green Party conference when I was 14. I've been in this movement for 35 years. The reason why I'm so unpopular is because I just connect the dots, right? There's no moral or strategic alternative, right, to civil resistance at the present moment. That's the reality. There's the um, place to sign up, by the way. <laughs> for October. I mean, we're, we're, we're out of time. I, mean, I think anybody who wants to understand climate science should read the IPCC, which Roger probably doesn't you know, think is empirically accurate, but is the agreed science of the UN. It does. It says... Everyone there, knows. It says, on, Everyone knows. knows. No, you know, no, no, you're putting me oh, down. No, you're I'm putting not. me down I again. I was just saying right. that everyone knows the IPCC reports have to go through Russia and Saudi Arabia. They're not science. They're a political document in order to the scientists do don't the have to accept movement, the amendments right? put down by go and look at the data yeah they are go and look at the data they are reviewed papers say the arctic is going to be melted by 2030 2035 right forget the ipcc look at the peer-reviewed papers look at the data we're done guys just accept it I, right. I, I feel there's been a lot of putting down of me and a lot of dismissal of me and the work I've done and the way I think I should act. Now, I think you can say there's, you're wrong. We're in a desperate situation here. We're all trying to find the way to use our resources in the best way yeah. to save us from the crisis that, that's here, you know, not just coming, it's here.